So welcome all to today's uh, webinar. Um, again, the name of it is being Understanding the Impact of uh, Internet of Things on, uh, on Service Information. That webinar today is brought to you by Ediplan. Um, how it works is uh, for the next, because uh, the total of the webinar is scheduled for about 30 minutes, uh, 25, well, maybe even 20 to 25 minutes, I'll be talking to you about the, today's topic. And then I'm going to leave about five minutes for uh, questions and, uh, and answers. The audio is provided through your speakers up to your PC or simply by calling in. You should have the number uh, as part of the invite. And then the webinar today will be recorded. And if you request a link, please do so by sending it to me, which is barry.brad at edaplan.com and I would like to ask you that in case you do have any questions feel free to answer or to ask them in the question box that you see on your right hand side and I'll do my best to uh, answer uh, all of them uh, towards the end of the, uh, the webinar. Um, okay, um, I'm your host today. My name is Barry Braster. I'm the Director of Sales for uh, Technical Documentation Services at Edaplan. You can see a little bit of my uh, resume on the, the right-hand side here, but my contact uh, information is on your left uh, bottom uh, corner. Uh, there's my email address, uh, my LinkedIn details, and if you would like to follow me on Twitter, then uh, there you go. There's my contact info. So, uh, a little bit briefly about Ediplan for those of you who are not familiar with uh, who we are. Uh, uh, we are currently about 2,500 uh, employees. Uh, engineering firm, but we provide uh, field uh, services in the field of technical documentation, engineering, as well as embedded systems and uh, and IoT services as well. Um, we're quite um, uh, a big company in the Nordics. Uh, we have our headquarters in uh, Finland. Uh, you see some financial numbers here, and we are a publicly traded firm. Um, I mentioned already the services that we do, so it's engineering, it's technical documentation, embedded systems, and IoT. And what's really so special about uh, these three service areas is that we are able to provide to our customers a basically a full, complete range of services from engineering all the way to IoT uh, and everything in between, including documentation, service information uh, uh, provided as a uh, as a service. So quite a unique uh, business concept there. For more information about that, of course, feel free to uh, to contact me. So let's get started. So how the Internet of Things um, and technical documentation, so both of them hand in hand, can actually improve the field service efficiency. So the guys and girls that work on a day to day basis out in the field to maintain uh, your equipment. Um, but in order to understand that, we first would like to dive into how then IoT is actually transforming service. Well, uh, service, and I say service now, but uh, you can also call it maintenance, you can call it aftermarket or after sales, is, is as a business is increasingly seen as, a, as very much as a strategic business function. A lot of companies sell their products almost sometimes at cost and, and have their profitability come actually from their service business. So it's more and more seen as a strategic business function. Uh, now where IoT comes in then, it's, it's not about IoT, and I'll explain what IoT is in, in, a, in a moment, but it's not just about how assets and, and devices then are connected uh, through the internet. It's actually how firms like yourselves can then improve the service by building better products and by boosting workforce productivity by actually combining documentation with IoT and everything that comes with it. Um, taking a closer look at uh, the service business, this was a uh, survey done by the Aberdeen Group a little while ago. Um, amongst the best in class in the maintenance business, as you can see that uh, a, a lot of folks out there uh, have a goal for 2016 needing to and uh, wanting to improve the customer retention, loyalty, and satisfaction. Uh, also, a lot would like to improve the service-related profitability. And then the third one I like very much, because it's close to my heart, is to improve the quality and the relevance of the surface data. So the stuff, the information that the engineers the field service engineer actually have to read and understand and work with. And then improve service information capabilities all the way down, as you can see, to expanding and the, uh, breadth, uh, the breadth and the complexity of service offerings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are the, were the top goals for service in 2016. But if we then look um, at why uh, certain things can still be improved, uh, this were the 
respondents' answers that a lot of the times the parts were not available, uh, the customer or the asset was not available for service, there was an improper diagnosis that was taking place, or the technician simply didn't have the right skills, or the resolution was only temporarily. And so and these are aspects we have to also then deal with. Um, some other research uh, 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 papers came out uh, not too long ago. Deloitte uh, included that uh, uh, 25 to 50 percent of the time of a service engineer's uh, well time is, is, is used in finding and understanding maintenance tasks. So if you have a maintenance task that can last you about five hours, close to half of that actually goes into working with maintenance information. So. 40% of fails, failed service visits of capital goods manufactured service networks were actually caused by lack of information. So, and that is something that we have to remember when later on we are talking about service information and how that can actually be facilitated together with IoT. Because if it's the service information that cannot be easy to find uh, or understand, then um, uh, that's also an issue that we need to deal with. So next part is then to look at the uh, internet of, uh, of things. Um, what is, um, um, oh, let me just go over to the questions there, no questions yet, yes. Uh, what is the internet of things? So some of you probably are familiar with it, uh, but for those of you who aren't, well, we have obviously a product traditionally, then more and more these days, uh, these products are becoming smarter. So that usually means that we have sensors uh, in them. And what do those sensors do? Well, they send these sensors are there to collect data about the particular product or machine. Um, but of course, to make these products even more smarter, the sensors then, of course, need to get rid of their data. They need to leave it somewhere. So they're broadcasting that data, and they need to have an online connection, obviously. And that's really where the term big data comes from. Now, the idea, of course, is when we have all of that data, then we retrieve that into a product system where we uh, analyze the data, where we have a dashboard, for instance, that can analyze all of these product uh, data, like, uh, you know, how is the engine running? What is the, you know, is it not overheating? What is the environmental uh, uh, story behind it? How warm or how cold or how, how rainy is it? There's a lot of data that can then be uh, uh, gathered and, and analyzed. And then the idea, of course, is whenever you do that with all of your different systems that you connect everything and then you can actually then do something with that data and then bring that all the way back to the service engineer who can then actually uh, work with that data to do for instance predictive maintenance which I will uh, discuss in a moment. So um, that being said, so uh, are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. So uh, this survey, again, by the Aberdeen Group shows that the best in class is an, an, an average of about 45% of uh, products that are currently actually uh, connected uh, remotely. So there's still quite a bit to gain there, but it also means it's not zero. So it's actually really, really increasing specifically in the last uh, few years. Um, so what is the impact then of uh, Internet of Things on, on the service business? Well. Again, what we have to understand here, it's not just about connectivity. Uh, it's about how we can generate value for our customers. Um, how can we continuously improve on the efficiency and the productivity of our customers' operations in case they use our machines to manufacture things? Uh, which, in the end, will not only make them happier customers, it allows us to also create new service offerings. So what that means is that we are moving from a traditional service model to a future service model that is not so much product transaction based but more about customer relationship. And how would that work in practice? Well, like this for instance, where back in the day or still actually the traditional way is we go from right to left. So there's a failure, um, uh, we react to that failure, um, we can then sometimes save time uh, by in days, for instance, by uh, uh, some data in the service information that allows us to already do some preventive maintenance. Um, but the more we go towards the future, we see that you know there's condition monitoring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the idea is that that will turn then into predictive maintenance, so that the data that a product uh, broadcasts allows us, based on the usage and the wear characteristics, for instance, it allows the data to be analyzed, and as a result, it will be able to predict failure. 
And through do, by doing that so, it means in the end, very practical, it would mean that the downtime of a machine can be, um, uh, well, uh, you basically be, uh, uh, be not having that happen. Um, uh, where in the old day, a machine would be out for five minutes, uh, days, uh, weeks, uh, sometimes even months. You would now, and you know, of course, uh, the longer a machine is, uh, is not doing its job, uh, the more money is, is lost uh, there. Um, um, think about an, an, an aircraft uh, who has to do maintenance uh, while you're waiting for it on the gate. Uh, this can cost an airline uh, hundreds and thousands of dollars. And the idea is that we then uh, uh, use IoT together with service information to allow for predictive maintenance so that there is actually no downtime at all. So it's all prevented. Um, so what does that mean also uh, for the service industry? Well, it means that, of course, it enhances it. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's allowing you to actually create new service offerings. It also allows for customer self-service to take place. Some uh, manufacturers are a fan of that, others are not, but it kind of depends on the type of product, of course, that you have, and it also has to do with safety uh, aspects. But there's a lot less on-site service uh, needed. There's much more remote uh, resolutions that can take place. And, of course, these will make customers happier, but it, at the same time, uh, the knife cuts in, in both ways, uh, on both ends, uh, meaning that you can also save time from the manufacturer's uh, point of view. So there's a lot of things to, uh, to gain there. Um, in this case, uh, what Siemens did, they wanted to turn their data generated every day uh, into more value for its customers. So this, this particular gas turbine that you're looking at has about 1,500 sensors into it, and it, it generates about 30 gig of data per day. So talking about the big data here, right? Um, now, through the smart evaluation, uh, evaluation tools, they were able to analyze this data and turned in the end, was able, were able to turn it into new service offerings. So 200 ideas for service out of which 12 new business models were developed just by using that data. The bigger picture then is uh, what I'm showing you right now is, is um, how does that all work or should work uh, together. So we have the sensors here on this particular truck, for instance. That is data uh, that is being sent out to the cloud. That, of course, then needs to be connected to uh, analytical programs that can do real-time analytics. Of course, they can be connected to, let's say, an enter uh, enterprise asset management system to check for certain rules. And then if there is a certain action that needs to take place, there can be a work order that can be sent over to field service guy, but at the same time, the field service guy should also be able to provide feedback into the cloud uh, or immediately do uh, diagnostics and uh, his or her maintenance task by standing next to the machine, being able to take all of that data. Then, of course, being linked to the service information, what is it that he or she needs to do? He needs to be able to find this information about it quickly. That information is not so much uh, in the traditional model published as a PDF file, but more interactively. I'll, I'll show you in, how that works in a moment. And then being able to provide feedback, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this is a bit of a complex picture, I can imagine, but it's really uh, where all of the data comes together, is combined, and provides, and in the end, serves as a basis um, uh, to provide the service engineer with information that he or she can, can work very well with. Now, what does that mean? Um, it, it, the way we work currently, for instance. Um, well, um, how is what's changing first and foremost, right? Well, um, short, everything is changing. Uh, the way people uh, consume uh, information, um, I heard um, uh, at a recent uh, uh, maintenance conference in, uh, in Sevilla in Spain, uh, there was the head of a very large air, uh, aircraft manufacturer who basically said, you know, end users will want to bring their home experience to work, which is true. I mean, it's also about the new generation of service engineers, and they are all used to working with mobile devices, and they would like to bring that experience to the workplace and not having to deal with a 300-page maintenance manual, as an example. Um, so that's changing. So the users are changing. Uh, what's it, what else is changing? Well, the way information is delivered. Uh, I mentioned already, uh, paper is one thing that's going out of business more and more. It's more uh, digital, of course. 
but a PDF file, even though it's digital, is still requiring an end user to browse through a lot of information. So people are more and more demanding an augmented reality or a virtual reality, if not just an interactive experience where they can use their mobile devices to get to information very quickly. Um, uh, because no one really is, is engaged to, uh, again, read through a 300-page manual, whether it's on paper or, or digital. Um, so the type of information then is also um, changing. Um, it's not just all information in one. You don't necessarily want to have your installation, use, and service information all in one manual. That will make it even harder to find. Uh, so that needs to be split up depending on who your end user is. And then, of course, the devices themselves. Uh, it still is paper, of course. We are moving to digital, but in the future, yes, we will be using more and more mobile devices, even going towards glasses, and who knows what we will be looking at in 10 years from now, right? But then the last aspect, of course, knowing IoT, knowing digitalization is around the corner, of course, is the security requirements. It's probably a very big thing. We all, I think, know that in the European Parliament, as well as in the US, uh, as well as in Asia, there's all sorts of legislations going on and being uh, created right now to deal with uh, cyber security. So that's also something that is very much uh, changing. The way information is delivered, I mentioned already, we're talking about augmented and virtual reality. Well, there's some examples uh, right here. And that being said, I'll quickly jump out of the presentation and I will um, move over to uh, an actual demo. I see a hand is raised, but I will uh, get back to you in a, in a moment. Uh, so let me go ahead and open up this video. Now, what we are currently looking at here is a, an iPad, obviously, an iPad user interface. And this was a video that we taped about two weeks ago at the Dutch Design Week, where it's an augmented reality application. Uh, it doesn't use any uh, codes or, um, um, uh, well, you don't see any QR codes, uh, nothing like that uh, here to, uh, to look at. It's basically doing that through object recognition. So I'm being asked to select a procedure, and I'm doing so. I'm, for instance, I'm going to click the steering oil front over here, and I'm moving around it. You can see it's quite uh, stable. And by clicking on the steering oil front, let me do that right now. There you go. You see that a, I need to, basically, this is what I need to do to remove the front steering oil cap. Okay, very good. I can click on the next uh, procedure. That's that little arrow over here. And then it tells me to uh, fill the steering oil reservoir until the max indicator. So um, using simplified English here for text, using simplified illustration here, these animations that you're looking at right here, what does that mean? I'll tell you in a moment. And then I can basically go back and look at other procedures right here, as you can see. So it's quite stable. It tells me the temperature of this device as well, as you can see right here on the top. So using some IoT information here, allowing me to basically just go through this procedure step by step. And that's obviously, as you can see, something totally different in comparison to, for instance, reading something from a paper manual. So that being said, going back to the uh, presentation. Um, let me go ahead and get that started again. So there's, of course, some information there as far as how information can also be presented here. But it's not so much about the wow factor, even though I'm sure you agree with me that it looks quite nice and, 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 and uh, sophisticated. It actually needs to be business case behind it. So how much money can it save us? How much engaging will it be towards our customers for them to allow us or for, for, for them to allow themselves to, of course, uh, buy uh, more products versus uh, the ones that our competitors have to uh, offer. So how does this actually impact the service information? So the way we create content, the way we manage content, um, uh, the way we uh, deliver uh, information, you know, how do we go from a PDF uh, uh, delivery to an, an app delivery uh, to uh, an experience delivery, meaning if you're talking about virtual or augmented reality, that's almost regarded as an experience. Um, um, and what does that mean for data types? So how do we connect data, right? Meaning the internet with the products, the things. So how does that work, the IoT? And how do them, do, do we uh, apply uh, the content? So product, how do we let the product be identified and, 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 and go to the next uh, step? Uh, well, 
this is the model that we have been using as Ethiplan for the last uh, couple of decades, I would say. Um, and this is how we work on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, it's the four key principles to uh, uh, technical documentation or technical content, however you want to call it. So for structure, we use a universal method, which could be DITA or S1000D, but there are other methods uh, out there as well. Uh, but these two are probably the most uh, known DITA for uh, uh, most industries, S1000D, if you're aerospace and defense, that is more known there and it allows for information to be structured, to be reused. XML really is the code here to provide for single sourcing data exchange. Uh, for the text itself then, we use simplified technical English. We have services and tools in-house that uh, we can help you implement, but the idea is that we make information clear, concise and consistent so that it can actually be published. Uh, well, number one, it needs to be understood very clearly. Number two, it can help you save cost on, for instance, translations. But number three, because we write very concise, it allows for the text to still be published. Rather than having very lengthy sentences, it's very concise so that people can read a sentence very quickly, understand it very quickly, and do their jobs more quickly which of course will uh, facilitate uh, efficient maintenance. And then the use of uh, illustrations uh, where we go from 3D to reusable SVGs or CGMs if you're in the S1000D for structure and simplification there as well. And then we have about 450 experienced documentation specialists. And what I mean with that is that if you're going to do this yourselves, it's not so much about methodology and tools. It's also very much about having folks in-house that uh, are very much trained and have the know-how in how to actually work with tools and methods themselves. It's important um, that you do so. The results are then that you first and foremost make information, information easier to find and understand, that you already will be able, without even going to an augmented reality experience, already be able to save downtime and improve the customer experience, to already be able to save costs thanks to efficiency in, in creation and management of, of data and content. Um, but with that, you will be able to make your information future-proof so that later on it can be going towards augmented reality, so that it can be connected to the data in IoT, and so that you are able to, while connecting that, you'll be able to publish all that information interactively, again, going back to the picture that I showed right here. So that's kind of the end goal where we are trying to uh, go uh, here. Um, and that means that as far as the current experience, yes, there's PDF, yes, there's interactive data, uh, there's even portal viewers, like the ones we have ourselves, which is called Hypersys, that will allow you to already get quite far with this. But the idea is, of course, that we're going to then connect that not only to IoT, turn it into an augmented reality experience. And this is not so much about needing the best of best to create that wow factor with your uh, customers, really. There also, and of course, there needs to be a business case. Where can we save money? How will we save money? How much money will be saved? How much time will be saved? How much, you know, business cases for creating service offerings all the way down to cost savings and everything in between, in essence. Um, that was it. Um, we are exactly at 25 minutes, I see. I'm now going to open up the room for questions and answers. But before I do that, I want to let you know my contact information. You, of course, can visit the website ediplan.com uh, for more information about uh, who we are and what we do. Technical documentation services specifically for more info on the tech doc uh, field of, of things, side of things. And then soikia.com is our website that uh, we have for uh, those of you who want to know more about our services in the field of IoT and embedded uh, systems. And then, of course, you are more than welcome to simply email me, barry.brasser at and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have or uh, forward you the details of those who can um, answer your questions for you. Uh, one question came up by uh, Marie-Louise Fleck. No warning signs in the procedure. Our German colleagues are going to faint. Oh, yes, of course, there's going to be the, the, the samples that I showed you, of course. In case there needs to be warning signs, you need to start with that, obviously. Um, it's just about how you can also present uh, information uh, there. Uh, what's actually nice to mention there is that on paper, you need to warn someone um, with uh, information, right? So if you say, okay, well, before you, uh, for instance, uh, touch the, 
Well, let me just go over to that particular uh, example right here. So let's say that you need to, before you loosen the screw over here and it's very hot, well, that's the nice thing about IoT. IoT, well, because of the data monitoring, it will be able to tell you whether this is too hot and where this should even uh, touch it, yes or no. Um, so that's the nice part. But of course, you can also add a warning or a caution uh, to that. Uh, that's not a problem uh, whatsoever. But the nice thing is to know here that if it's IoT, thanks to the monitoring data, it will already be able to warn you, hey, actually don't touch this because it's 45 degrees Celsius right now or hotter, for instance. Any other questions? Let me see. Well, it looks like there's no further questions. Really, folks, was it that simple? Perfect. Okay. Well, then uh, we are then approaching the 30 minutes, so that means that if there's no further questions, I'm going to uh, close off this uh, webinar. Uh, not, of course, before thanking you all for your attention and um, uh, welcoming you to the next uh, webinars, which we will be uh, providing to you uh, soon. So, uh, oh, Mary Louise comes with one more question. Is the end user professional mechanic so stupid that he doesn't know what is hot? No, of course not, Mary, but it's, it's not so much. It's about, look, the information that we have at hand is, of course, being used to facilitate the work of a, a mechanical engineer. And, of course, it's about the information that is in there to be able to provide that to your end user in such a way that they can actually uh, work with it, and that's more uh, engaging. And minimalism, of course, is something that you need uh, that you want to achieve, but minimalism should always go hand in hand with uh, a standard like simplified English, for instance, because if I tell you that the goal is uh, is to minimalize, then that's not the goal. The goal is to actually create clarity. So if you say turn off engines not required, then it could mean to either turn off all the engines that are not required, but it could also mean that turning off the engines isn't required at all. So where we, where we now meet the uh, standard of, of minimalism, we are no longer meeting the standard of clarity. So it's actually minimalism together with the use of simplified English that will give you the best results. So any further questions, again, feel free to let me know at barry.braster uh, at adaplan.com. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.